The road of life is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. Right or wrong, make a decision. Hi, everybody. It's Pete Oliver. Welcome to the Emerge On Purpose podcast. This podcast is for sales reps and managers who want to become better leaders. Each show, we'll talk about a different leadership principle that will help sales reps and managers emerge on purpose. So Pete, you and I were chatting the other day and came up with this topic and uh, we decided that this might be a really good one to dissect together, whether leadership or sales reps. Uh, really, you asked me, when navigating an enterprise sale, what is the ultimate goal of every sales process? Share with me <laughs> what you said. Well, I, th- I think one of the misconceptions on that question is we think to ourselves, well, we need to convince somebody that we're the best. We need to convince somebody that they need to move forward. And anytime that we start feeling that way, it's frankly the opposite of the way we should want to approach the sales process, at least from an attitude perspective. It's more about enabling somebody else's ability to make a decision. Right? That, that's really our goal as a salesperson is, is to be a part of somebody else's decision-making process and then bring them to a place that's a win-win. And if you can't get there, you got to be okay with that outcome too. But if, if we can't have that mindset, then the minute that the client senses that we go into convince mode, we're done. So it's all about enablement. It's the, it's, it's the enable somebody else's ability to make a decision. So you make that sound so easy, right? And giving someone the ability or enabling their ability to make a decision. So how can we break that down to, for folks who are saying, well, wow, that, that sounds so easy. Sound, sounding is one thing and, and doing is one is another. So maybe start with, starting with the mindsets. What is the mindset of somebody who, who can actually do something like that? Yeah, it is not easy. I mean, that basically, Lindsay, that's, that's the whole system it is putting ourselves in a position to sit on the same side of the table with our clients and then work together to solve a problem and, and help them accomplish an outcome. And you're right, the decision itself is the outcome of the whole sales process. So imagine what's going to occur before that ultimate outcome happens. First off, there has to be trust. We have to have that mindset. You mentioned mindsets. We have to have that mindset that trust needs to be established. And how do we do that? Well, we need equal business stature. Okay, we need to find some commonality. Okay, we, we need to be good listeners. We need to ask good questions. All of that goes into trust. And then at, at some point, we're going to learn about what the client wants to accomplish. And they're either trying to avoid pain or seek out some form of a gain, probably both. That's the outcomes they're trying to achieve. And, and then you evolve into the sales process. And sooner or later, we're going to earn the right to understand actually how they're going to make the decision. Right. I, I think a common misconception when, with Sandler specifically is we actually have a step that's called the decision step. But that, that doesn't mean that they are making the decision, it means that we understand how they're gonna make the decision, when they're gonna make the decision, why that's the when. So the complexity of an enterprise sale, a lot of times does happen in the nuances of their decision-making process, right? But just knowing that is not gonna solve the problem of managing the entire sales process because there's other elements that go into it too. But today that's what we're going to talk about is how do we navigate the client's decision-making process. For folks who are tuning into this and they want to invest 20, 30 minutes, what are we going to walk through today? What are we going to share with them to say, heck yeah, that was worth my time investment. What are some how-tos that we're going to be able to offer? Yeah, let's put it into context. So in the context of any client's decision-making process, it always starts with their goal, their pain. Okay. And, and then if the, if the gap is big enough, they're going to decide that they want to change. And then in order to do so, they're going to have to make decisions on their investment strategy and how they're going to 
actually get the funding, the time, the resources in order to make the change. And then their decision-making process is gonna kick into play. So they've decided there's a gap and now they've decided that they wanna fill the gap. They know that they need to change. So how are they gonna actually make that decision to change? That's what we're talking about today. And then how do we, as a partner to that client, navigate that with them? I love it. You mentioned uh, a moment ago, earning the right. So for, for those folks who, how do I earn the right to their trust? How do I build that trust and credibility? What would that sound or look like specifically uh, for a sales rep or a sales leader who's navigating the sales process? You got to be okay with no. You have to exude equal business stature. You have to do things in the client's best interests. You have to ask the tough questions. You need to listen very effectively. All of those things, there's a, there's a saying that actually one of my clients told me a few months ago is, you gain trust one drop at a time, but you can lose it by the bucket full. Mm. So if, if you're gonna be on this same side of the table with the client as they are navigating their own decision-making process, you would have already done a bunch of drips of trust that led to the point where, where, where that's happened. So it's simple things like on the front end of the front end of a prospecting call, when you say out loud, let's do this. How about I tell you why I'm calling and we together can decide if we should keep talking. That, that's going to earn trust. Okay. If you set an upfront contract at the beginning of a sales call and then you stick to it, that's going to earn trust. If you sense there's something that you need to learn and don't know yet, and you ask the tough question, that's going to earn trust. Okay, at some points you might fall on the sword and you might say things like, you know, I probably should know this and don't, but when, that's going to earn trust. So it, it's being real, it's being authentic, it's being yourself, but it's being yourself also results in something that's in the best interest of, of your clients. Yeah, what it sounds like from some of those little talk tracks you were just sharing or techniques, it's being a human being. So Pete, from what you just shared, a lot of those little talk tracks or how to's really sounds to me is just being a human being, knowing that the person across the screen from you or across the table, maybe one day again soon, is just another person. But so often we're talking to reps or talking to leaders, and that's such a struggle. It seems like sales is something you do to some to someone, not just an interaction between human beings. So talk about that. What where what are those traps that we fall into and why do we fall into them? And how can we prevent those traps? Yeah, a lot of times if it comes across like it's a move and it's something you're doing to somebody instead of with somebody, it, it's very transparent. It's inauthentic. So that that's why we, we talk a lot about changing behaviors with things that managers and reps do with, with their teams on sales calls. And we rehearse it, we practice it. And I was, I used to play basketball as a kid and there's a thing I went through when I was shooting and I wanted three 90 degree angles. I wanted one here, I wanted one here, and I wanted one here. And when I'm practicing, that's the only thing I'm thinking about. But in the game, am I thinking about my three 90 degree angles? No, I'm just gonna go do it. And practice does make us better, but when we're on a sales call, you have to be you, it has to be authentic. So there's, there's no difference there in thinking about how you're navigating the decision-making process. You're going to follow some steps, but you have to do it in a way that's authentic to you. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if I shot underhanded or like this, and that's what's authentic to me, it's going to work because it won't. But the next time we go back and we practice, we get away from that habit and we change it. Some habits are going to be 180 degrees different. Other habits could be a one, two, three percent shift. And we work with some sales reps that they're already making a million bucks a year. They're, they're successful doing what they do. It, it's not like in a situation like that, they're looking for 180 degrees. They're already really good, but it's one little tweak that they need to make that can have a gigantic impact on their success. So 
inside of that decision-making process, it could be something really small and subtle, or it could be huge. Like you're asking the questions at the wrong time. You're asking the questions in the wrong order. Those are things that are correctable and huge. The, the little minute details might be the inflection in your voice when you ask it, or it, it might be how you transition to asking the question. Another point, there's a, there's a really fine line between it, it feeling like you're interrogating your client and you're having a conversation with your client. A lot of times in the decision step, it can turn into an interrogation. And that's a no-no. That's something that, that can't happen. So the, the other thing is it's, it's not a check the box situation. Mm. The decision step for a client is, especially in a large enterprise sale, it's constantly evolving. So our decision-making process needs to evolve with it. it. It's not like check the box, I found it out, it's over. Nope, you got to constantly validate it. You got to constantly know what changed. You got to constantly know you're missing something. So it, th that's that's a big part of it too. Yeah, I uh, I appreciate what you said about being authentic. And one of my favorite Sandler rules is feel it, say it. So you can say anything to anybody it, as long as you nurture it. And I think that for me, when I was first starting out in Sandler, I'm a little intimidated uh, calling people much older than me or much more experienced than me. Uh, and, and it actually released the pressure valve that feel it say it because I didn't have to be perfect. And to your point, even with asking questions, saying actually saying that, hey, I don't want this to be an interrogation right now, but I have some questions that I really need answers to in order to identify if this is a fit. So just being able to, what exactly is on my mind? Like, I don't wanna make this an interrogation, but giving myself the permission to say it, that was just such a switch for me. And that is where that authenticity comes out. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. Like I'll give you, I'll give you an actual example. So during one of our sales processes, I was working with our now client, and I was trying to understand their decision-making process. And, and at one point when I was asking the, how are you going to decide questions? They said, when we narrow down the potential partners to two, we're going to put them in front of the executive committee. And then the executive committee, along with myself, and th at that point, the, the economic buyer as well, we're going to decide. And in that moment, I said, I'm guessing we haven't earned the right to make the final two yet. Is that a fair statement? And she said, no. I go, not surprised. I'm guessing that's probably where we should start. She said, yeah. Okay. I said, okay, well, what should we do next in order for you to get comfortable either way? And then she told me the rest of her decision-making process. So here, here's some complexity where you're looking at the entire organization, but if you don't have a champion inside of that broader decision-making process, then you're probably not going to win. So at that moment, I knew that I didn't have a champion yet, but I also knew that this, this person was willing to go down that path to figure it out either way. And so that was my answer to that. And it was authentic and it was inside of the system and it was the right thing to do at the time. After the fact, I learned that our competition said, okay, well, I need access to, basically they said, I need access to the economic buyer. We can't proceed. Now, that's not how they were going to make the decision. So why would we want to fight that? Because one of those other Sandler rules that's really important when you're trying to navigate somebody's decision-making process is influencers have the ability to say no, but they can't say yes. We want to get to a place where the influencing parties are influencing in the right direction. And we don't want to be a reason why they would go in a different direction. So, I mean, that's just one example of how you try to be authentic inside of the process itself. Yeah, it goes back to your point of it's not check the box, especially no. when things are so complex or there are these enterprise sales, multiple decision makers. You can't just demand or ask these blanketed questions 
I need access to this. There is a grace and finesse that comes with that, to your point earlier, with tonality, with reading the room and having those feelers out and knowing that influencer that you're speaking to that maybe can't make the decision, knowing how to uh, build that trust with them. It, even if they're not the ultimate decision maker or one of them, you've got to earn it slowly and climb up the ladder. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you another quick example too. It would another situation with a client and they had found out a, a lot of times that what you believe is the decision-making process isn't exactly what we thought. Maybe it's because we were assuming too much, or maybe it's because the client changed it where they are in their own decision-making process. And then you hear through a coach or somebody that does want you to win that may not necessarily be your champion, that this is going on. And now all of a sudden you got to make a tough call to one of the players at your potential partner and ask them a really hard question. And, and to me, that's where the attitude of five seconds of courage comes in. Why do we not make that call? Okay, are, are we afraid of conflict? Do we want to be liked too much? Are we afraid of no? Okay, do we go on Hope Island? Like we all know hope is in strategy. But when you're going to pick that phone up and, and ask that question, then that in and of itself is controlling the decision-making process. Because if you don't know what the process is, how can you control it? So th there, is, there is times where you have to make the hard call and say things like, Hey, Jim, at this point, uh, I feel like we're in a pretty good place, but I know I'm missing something and I just don't know what it is, right? Can you share with me a, a conversation path that we haven't had yet and probably should? I want to make sure that you're hundred percent comfortable in either direction. And, and at this point, I feel like there, there may have been some things that, that we missed. And I want to just give you an opportunity to let me know if that was true or not. Yeah, Pete. We never talked about this. Okay, great. Okay, we, we can't solve problems if we don't know what they are. So sometimes, whether it's in the decision step, the pain step, the budget step, we're, we're gonna, at times, have to be okay with having tough conversations. Yeah, how you just phrased it really opens up that dialogue and gives them the permission almost to just share everything that's on their mind in a very comfortable environment. Uh, I think that I read when I was thinking about this podcast, decisiveness, that skill of, of decisiveness is choosing a course of action with ease and speed. And we, as sales folks, as sales leaders, sure, or as humans, we are in the instant gratification. We want things when we want them. We want it now. Uh, but something that we say in San Laurel all the time is, is we've got to slow down to speed up. So would you talk about that in this context a little bit more of, of how we need to slow things down sometimes and trying to speed things up, how we can uh, get ourselves in trouble there? Yeah, I mean, that's... That's a tough one because I, I would probably put myself in that decisive category. Like okay. I'd rather ask for, for uh, forgiveness and permission in my, a lot of times in my personal life anyway. But yeah, it, like here's an example. So let's say we're, we're in an enterprise sale and it's, it's kind of a technical sale. And there's two decisions that have to be made. One is the technical decision and one is the business decision. Okay, we know what the client wants. They wanna know if there's a technical fit. So they're going to start trying to get us to march out all of our smart people and our technology and do POVs and do, do testing and, and can I try it? And there's a lot of that is going to pop into play. And we as, can I see a demo? Okay. Things like that will pop up in the sales process. And we know that there's things that it would be nice that we understood before the demo started, before the POV started, before the test started, because if, if, if not, then after the fact, we're going to be in a worse place. And so is the client because we're not, we're not managing their decision-making process on the business side. 
So we should slow down. We should say things like, Lindsay, happy to go there. Before we do, do you mind if we hit the pause button? I'd like to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And let's pretend we do. Can you share with me what's going to happen next? That's just a slight slow down part of the process where we're not assuming we know what's going to happen when it's over. Okay. We call it time machine questions. And that was very subtle, but basically what I'm asking for is what's going to occur after that technical step, but we're going to find it out before. So we slowed it down a little bit to get rid of that mutual mystification that a lot of times can, can just cause challenges later in the process, especially when it has to do with their decision-making step. Sure. A lot of times we hear if we're in a training session on this topic and we're sharing, don't go into the pitch immediately. Don't jump into the demo immediately. And we'll hear things which are all true that uh, the, the decision makers or the prospects are saying, well, I want a demo. Well, I want this. If you want to have time with me, you're going to give me this. You're going to give me that. So how, what, what would you say to those reps? Obviously slow down to speed up, but when it comes to potentially finding the fit or disqualification, how to make that shift, to not jump into pitch, even though that's so uh, tempting and that's what they're asking for. Ultimately, you're at the uh, whim of the prospect. You're letting them control everything. So how yeah. do we get out of that mode? How do we have those the, the guts five seconds at a time, to your point, to stop that from happening? Because it just can trickle into a, a bad habit. Yeah, it can. And there's the, there's the rip your face off type reps that'll be like, uh, no, not unless I get access to the economic buyer. And can, can you show me a, a blank check first? And then, yeah, then I'll show you a demo, but I'm not going to do it until you, no, we don't want to fight our clients. It's not, sure. it's not going to work. I actually would say, yes, happy to go there. But before we do, do you mind if I ask a few questions? I'd like to understand what you're looking for to make sure that the demo is the best use of your time. So you don't fight them. You, again, you want to make it feel like you're sitting on the same side of the table, but we, because here's the problem, Lindsay, we could spend three hours demoing the product and I'm not sure which hour you actually care about. So it would be good if I understood what you're trying to achieve, what some of those outcomes are, you know, what some of those challenges you've already tried to address and couldn't. And having that understanding ahead of time, I think, for maybe we won't even need a demo. Maybe it will our, you or I will already decide it, it, it's not needed. But as, assuming that your goals are in alignment with our other clients, we'll, we'll probably go there, but can we have that conversation first? They're not going to say no to that. And if they do, you got a problem because bad prospects make bad clients. So. So true. And it's also what you just said is different than what majority of everyone else is doing, right? If, uh, if you, with your product and service are standing here, your biggest competitor is here and your other biggest competitor is right next to you and you're all doing the exact same thing, jumping into pitch or demo, what is it gonna come down to? If you all are talking about your best features and benefits, it's gonna come down to price, who has the lowest price. So differentiating yeah. yourself in that way. And that's, it's it's easier said than done, but once you do it a couple of times, you see that it reaps some benefits, hopefully. Well, here's, here's the, frankly why I love Sandler. Sandler is like the why behind the what, and then we layer the how on top of it. So why would we do it or attempt to do what I just did? Well, because we know that pain, budget, and decision comes before the presentation step. So if they're asking for a technical demo, that's a technical presentation. If we didn't get pain, budget, and decision first, then we're out of order. So by me saying that, it's because I wanna recognize the why behind the what and then put the process back in the right order. And now why, why, why is that the right order? Because that's how the client's gonna make the decision. So they're, they're already beyond their own process to determine 
what their problem is, how much they're willing to invest in it and how they're going to decide. But we need to be caught up. Okay, we haven't seen that movie yet. So in order for us to be able to sit on the same side of the table, we got to watch the first half of that movie together. So by me saying, happy to go there, but before we do, do you mind if I ask you some questions about, about your current situation and why it's important to you? That's me saying, I got to hit the rewind button and watch the movie with you. And if not, then without pain, all we are is a price. So even if we're successful in the technical part of technical validation, if you will, even if we're successful there, if we don't do the pain step, we're going to get beat up on price at the end of the process. And we don't want that to happen either. But Lindsay, I, I would suggest, why don't we talk about like the right order for the decision step? Do you want to go there? Beautiful. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I, th that's exactly where I was going. Uh, how to navigate that order. We hear that over and over again. It's what are the questions? We know who, what, when, where, why, but how do we get that in the right order? So we're put, positioning ourselves to continue to build that trust, to set ourselves up uh, on the T where we're, we're the front the front runner. Yeah. And again, the order, there's two, two things that we want to look at. One is what's the right timing to go there and then try to chunk out a, a pretty big majority of understanding their decision-making process. And then there's, okay, we're in this decision step now. What's the order in which we want to uncover all the different elements of how they're going to make a decision. So as far as like when, after pain, and maybe after budget, but definitely after pain, we need to know why the client has decided there's a project to begin with. Okay. It's not like Lindsay, if I walked up to you and I was like, Hey, Lindsay, uh, are you the decision maker? Like, that's not the first question I'm going to ask you because why, that's going to create friction. So the right time to, to go down that decision-making step path is after you understand what they're trying to achieve. Okay, in the context of pain or gain, whatever it is that's motivating them, right? And then we want to sneak budget in there too. A lot of times that's budget. It's, there's less friction if you have a good budget conversation on the heels of a pain step. So, but decision also can't happen until the pain step does. Okay. Yep. Does that make sense? Makes sense. I, I don't know if it makes sense to, for a minute, just talk about the budget uh, conversation. Just tap that really quickly for those who aren't familiar with Sandler uh, and, and why it's so important that we're doing it in that order. We've got the pain, we understand their needs, then what happens during that budget and, and why is it important we do that long before we ever really give a presentation to? Okay, Lindsay, repeat after me, ready? You got it, ready. Pain equals money. Pain equals money. Pain, pain, pain equals money, money, money. Pain, pain, pain equals money, money, money. We as humans were conditioned to change if, if we have an extreme amount of pain or we have a goal that is just so in our face that if we don't accomplish it, it's going to be a problem, right? So the reason why we say that we want to have the budget conversation which is investment, okay? It's not a spend conversation. It's not a pricing conversation. It's what are they willing to invest to make their pain go away? So that's why we say the budget conversation has to be preceded by pain, okay? But the pain is also not a check the box. We're gonna constantly be going back to that throughout the sales process. So we're, we're gonna wanna understand and make sure that the, that the pain is, is, is there's no, there's no, the anatomy of the pain step means that we both know that they have a problem, okay? Oracle. So we want to have that conversation. Then we want to go to budget because pain, pain, pain equals money, 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 okay? Then decision. Now in an enterprise sale, you might go pain budget with one person. Then you might go pain decision with another person. Okay, but it's definitely going to be pain first. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
Um, so when we get to that decision process, you were talking about the when, the why, the when. Can you expand upon that a little bit and why that that why the when is is so important? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk about all the different elements of decision. Cool. So you've got when. Okay, that's your reverse timeline. Now the when is not when you get the PO. The when should be when they get it implemented. Because we care about the PO, they care about changing whatever's going on in their world. So it's when they're able to implement is really what we want to understand and then reverse timeline back from there. So another way to hit pain from a different angle is to layer on why the when, okay? Now, in addition to that, we want to know the how. We want to know the what their process is. Like, how are they actually going to decide what their process is and then who's involved? Okay. So you've got when, why the when, what their process is, how they're going to decide, and then who's involved. Okay. It's almost like a newspaper reporter. When, who, how, what, all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Occasionally there's a where. Occasionally that, that comes into play too. So we want to start with the when. Okay, now, now why? Because in order for us to support their process, we can't do that if we don't know when they want to decide by. So that's step one. Step two, why the when? That hits pain from a different angle. And it, it almost helps to create the reverse timeline from their perspective. The big trap sales reps sometimes do is they'll say things like, hey, I, Lindsay, I, I forecasted this deal and my boss is really wondering if it's gonna come in this month. Can you give me an update, please? Right? Thanks. Or your price is gonna expire at the end of the month if you don't get me the PO by the 30th. Right, they'll say things like that. Now, whose timeline is that? That's that's our timeline. That's the rep's timeline, which the yeah. client can give two shits about. Throwing a, a free toaster, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, what's it going to take for you to get in this car today? The today is that rep's timeline. That's not necessarily the person that's walking in the door's timeline. So we want to know their why behind the when, because it solidifies more pain. And it also helps us justify their reverse timeline, okay? So we do that first because it's about them. If you would, you've mentioned reverse timeline a couple of times. Could you give an example of what that would sound like in the context of, a, of the sales process and where we are now? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's literally working back from their end game. And then understanding all of the steps that are involved all the way from, we want this implemented to we're gonna buy it, to it's gonna go through legal, to it's gonna go through procurement, to we're gonna make the business decision. We're gonna make the technical decision. We're gonna have a committee meeting. It's gonna to go to the board. When you get into the what and the how, you know, what is their process? Okay, how are you going to decide? All of that is going to fit inside that reverse timeline. That's why you go to the to the when first, because that sets the parameters for us to ask, ask the what and the how questions. Seems like a lot of work. Well, yeah, it is a lot of work, but that's why they pay us the big bucks. <laughs> right, right. That's why it works, right? Getting getting all that information up front so it can continue to be smoother along the way. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things in smaller sales can be assumed. Sure. Larger sales, not so much. Like smaller sale, hey, I got this problem. I really need to fix it. And if I don't, I'm going to get fired. Well, do you have the ability to make the decision yourself or do you need to involve other people inside your organization? You can know in 10 minutes how they're going to make the decision. And then you either can solve the problem or you don't. In an enterprise sale, it doesn't work like that. You, you, you have to be very surgical with the, with the decision step. 
How about when we're going through these different questions, like a reporter, who, what, where, when, why, why, the, when, a lot of times we're having to deal with different personalities, personalities that are different than us. So it might be fairly easy to go through these questions uh, when it's someone who's similar to our cadence, similar to our personality, perhaps they're very direct or, and you're very direct. They like blunt and to the point, you like blunt and to the point, but what about those folks that might be on the opposite or a little bit different than you, where you, you know that uh, this is a good opportunity. You, there is pain, there is budget, but you just are butting heads in general. What do you do then? Do you have any examples of, of that or, um, in the context of, of however you want to slice it. One well, big question might be, well, why are we butting heads? And sure. It, selling is somewhat of a linear process because that's how the clients decide. It starts with, they've got a problem. Then they've said, yeah, I want to fix it. And then they, then they go through their steps to determine what that is. So from a, from the other side of the equation, they're saying themselves, well, who do I, who do I trust to, to, to tell somebody that I have a problem? Okay, like who am I willing to share the truth with? And then what is that truth? Well, it's my problem. And then who am I gonna to allow to get to the, the power inside of my own organization? Like that's what they're saying. So if, if we mess up along the way, it could have been at, at the trust, step okay it could have been at the truth step we didn't ask the right questions okay it could have been at the pain step like we didn't really understand why they wanted to do what they were going to do okay or it could have been we didn't just we didn't find a way to get the power so it's like if, if we have a problem it's probably our fault and we probably need to hit the rewind button right it, what we're not going to say is well they didn't move forward because they didn't have any money here that person just couldn't make a decision or they wouldn't let me get to the CIO or no, that's your fault. You, you didn't earn the right to get to the CIO. You didn't know why they were going to make a decision. So a lot of times we have to have some intellectual humility to determine like what we could have done differently. And if we can't do that, we're just going to keep making the same mistakes. So, but you're right. There's different decision-making styles There's different communication styles. That's why during the bonding and rapport step, we talk a lot about, understanding how clients make decisions because the the absence of knowing that like as an example are they big picture are they detail we don't know that we're going to sell the way we would want to be sold to and we're going to be wrong half the time so yeah and that's exactly where i was going probably didn't ask the question very well but you hit on another point which is great what if are you are butting heads and it's not a smooth uh flowing human to human conversation but I was thinking about, yeah, the opposite, opposing personalities. Say you're a big picture person. That's how you like to buy. But your prospect is a highly analytical, highly detailed, wants a lot of data, lots of numbers, lots of figures. It might be a little frustrating for you as a person who prefers big picture, but how do you adjust that? And how do you know uh, and help them uh, not get in their way, in their own way of making a decision when someone's completely opposite of you or just maybe different. Yeah, it's probably a topic for another, another podcast. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But I think the, the mindset, like the why behind the what is, I think we all grew up, treat people the way you want to be treated. Like that's how we grew up. That was advice we got from authority figures, but that's not really what we want to do. It's we want to treat people the way they want to be treated. So we need to seek to understand. And if we do that and we understand how they want to go about their own decision-making process, how they want to be communicated to, like I'll ask, Lindsay, what's your back phone? What's your, you know, that red one, when it rings, you pick it up. Like, what is that for you? Is it text? Is it LinkedIn IM, is it, is it email, is it phone? Like, and then 
they answer the question. So we're now mapping to their communication style instead of doing it the way we would want to be doing it. Love it. Uh, one last question that I want to hit before we go. We touched on this early on, uh, the notion of convincing versus discovery. And we didn't really touch on that at all. So just wanted to kind of wrap it up with why that's so important. And maybe, you know, what does that look like, that convincing versus discovery model in an everyday scenario? And how, what does that look like in sales? And how can we leverage that in all aspects of our life to just have better communication, but allow other people to have that decisiveness that we could all use, especially when we're dealing with relationships and um, in our lives. Yeah, it's Newton's law of physics. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, if you and I were in the same room and I said, Lindsay, put your arm out. And then I started pushing, you would push back. Okay. That's why convincing doesn't work. It, it, it makes the client push back. Even if it's in their best interest not to, that's going to be their, their initial reaction. So if we have that convinced mindset, like what's it going to take for you to get in this car today type mindset, then we're constantly putting up a barrier that, and we're working against ourselves and the clients. So if we take the opposite approach to that, every action is an equal and opposite reaction, that, and we do the opposite of what the client would expect in a convinced sales rep, that's what's gonna work. Well, probably date myself, but there was this one Seinfeld where Costanza just decided he was gonna start doing the opposite with everything he did in life. And, it worked for him. He started seeing this, this like immediate change in results that he was getting because he, he just went with the opposite. And I think that's now, what do I mean? The opposite of convinced mode. Okay. Sure. That's so how does that work in everyday life? Well, there's, there's times when you're going to say things like probably no chance there's any open tea times today. When I can see on the tea sheet, there's no open tea times. Okay. Well, Pete, let me see if I can work you in. There's this one foursome that, that may not show up. Let me call them and see if they're, they're not going to show today. Versus calling up and saying, hey, I just, I just put a lot of money down in this club and I can't believe that I can't get a tea time. Why did I waste my money at this place? This is ridiculous give me a tea time now like which one do you think you might get a better result on okay sure. now you may still not get the tea time okay but your chances of getting it are better just happened at the bank yesterday actually i'm at the bank <laughs> it's like this is probably a good way to wrap up i'm at the bank lisa and i are trying to set up a a, a new banking relationship here in Florida. And there's this huge line. There's, there's like 10 people in line at the teller. There's five people sitting down in the waiting area, waiting to see the bankers. And the, this person after, by the way, I, I just waited for somebody to come up to us. I mean, that in and of itself is the opposite of convinced mode. And um, as this, this person comes up to us to, to, hey, how can I help you? Do you have an appointment? Right. This other gentleman that was sitting there was like, I just want to say that I don't think I should have to wait. And and then started going at the the person that was trying to help everybody that's there. And this particular person had a three o'clock appointment and it was 250 and he was complaining about it. And I just said to the gentleman, I'd, I'd be happy to take your three o'clock if, if you'd like to come back at a different different day. And then he, he started apologizing to me and her. And then at 302, we were in another office without an appointment because I said, you know what, you're busy. Maybe we should come back at a different day. It doesn't seem like there's any way you could take us today. 
And uh, she goes, well, I think I can fit you in. And then five minutes later, we were sitting down and getting it done. So it, that's, that's the opposite of what a convinced person would do. Sure. Yeah. The, the, the pull them towards you versus pushing uh, makes me think of as an adolescent when my mom would tell me to do something, convince me to do who knows what it was, probably some sort of preparation for who knows what, a test, a quiz, a tryout. And I uh, always felt that you know I knew best and, and that wasn't um, necessary until I finally had to fail forward and maybe uh, get some poor grades or, or uh, not make, make the team. Uh, so I had to kind of discover on my own <laughs> through failure. I think that happens too. Um, that, yeah, you, you, through, though we can help people discover through good questions and uh, acting like a human being and dropping your guard down and, and releasing that pressure belt. Like, yeah, it doesn't like work that. all the time. Last week we were, <laughs> we were in Fort Lauderdale and I was visiting a buddy and we were going out to dinner and the, the beach was so crowded and everything was booked. I go into the restaurant and probably no chance we can get a table tonight. It looks like you're really busy. Nope, no chance. Two, three hours out. <laughs> okay. I, it doesn't work, you know, it's like, what, what am I going to do? Then, of course, I did try to go into cell mode and be like, how about, how about a 20? Will 20 get us a table? And, and so you, you can try to convince, but you want to go to enable first and see if that works. Agreed. Agreed. Awesome. Well, I agree. It's a great place to wrap up. Uh, we hit a number of topics uh, today in particularly in particular excuse me how to navigate that complex decision making process there's so much nuance to it there's so much finesse to it uh, but really when it comes to enterprise sales how do we make sure that we have those tools in our toolkit to position ourselves to allow somebody to be more decisive and and choose that course of action with ease and speed uh, without uh, uh, pushing them in that direction, but having them discover that they can do it on their own. In our next podcast, we're going to be tackling a few hacks to stay proactive with top of the funnel. So looking forward to that conversation. Uh, little teaser, Pete, um, for, for that podcast and what we're going to be uh, chatting about there. Yeah, I think one of those challenges we probably all have at this point is instant gratification and you know, the attention span that we all have is shrinking. And so when it comes to prospecting, we don't have instant gratification. So sometimes it's hard to stay motivated and we end up letting days, weeks, months slip by where we were inactive when it comes to top of funnel. And every week that goes by, we're losing 2% of our year. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? And I, the reason why I wanted to do this particular topic is because I've been thinking about that a lot for myself lately. So I needed to hack my own brain to figure out how to, how to stay motivated with top of funnel when business is good. So uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about is, is how do we stay consistent with top of funnel prospecting behavior? Cool. Looking forward to it. Uh, that'll be a good discussion. And um, w with that, we'll uh, see, see you next time. Any last words? Until then, keep climbing. Do you ever find that your prospect's decision-making process is a mystery? Do you get stuck with people who claim they can make decisions, but really can't? Then you're left wondering what to do next? We at Sandler Sailfish excel at the how-tos in sales and sales management. Book a discovery meeting with us today. A discovery meeting is a simple exchange of information to determine fit. A discovery between two parties, nothing more. We've helped thousands of purpose-driven sales leaders and sales professionals just like you to shorten sales cycles, consistently meet sales forecasts, and take control of the sales process once and for all. Go to salefish.sandler.com backslash book a call or scan the QR code on your screen. Until then, keep climbing.